in. Natasha Watley in the box ready to go against Lee Chi, the starting pitcher for China. Watley likes to slap the ball the other way quite a bit. She has tremendous speed, and she's behind 0-1. It's kind of a half bunt, half swing that she has mastered. Betting 441 in the tour that the U.S. has had all over the country. And that's fouled back. 0-2. Li Chi, 24 years old. This will be her second Olympics. Already pitched three innings this weekend. Li Chi, a left-handed pitcher who throws the ball low in the zone, so she's been working on a drop and a rise. She will also paint the corners with a fastball and has an outstanding changeup that the U.S. hitters are going to have to respect. Trying to strike out Wiley, just missed low and away. One and two. Chi pitched in a couple of games this weekend against Canada. One more. How important is this for both of these teams measuring themselves before they go to Beijing and play against each other? Well, this weekend is very important for both of these teams. International experience, especially for the younger athletes who have not played in an Olympic Games before, uh, is very important. They, they get to basically judge themselves, test themselves. And also, when you know your competitor, which a lot of these athletes do while they're on tour, when you play international teams, you don't know them as well. It's a, it's a good test. It's a good judge. The 2-2 two -two to Watley slapped. Down the left field line. And Natasha Wally, anytime she can put the ball down to the left side, if she can get that ball to hit the dirt twice, there's a very good chance she's going to be safe. Take a look at this pitch on the outside corner, and Natasha Watley with the best back control in the game. That ball just barely foul. She is borderline out of the batter's box when she hits the ball. It's very close. Run and slap. You can see her front foot lands at the front of the box. It's timed perfectly. Ground ball to short. Shaw throws out Watley, which is no easy feat with her speed. One away. Finch with a count of one and one on Pon Shaw, who will be appearing in her first Olympics in 2008. And behind the count, one and two. When you have an inning like the bottom of the second, and the U.S. scored four, that's a long inning. How does that affect Finch? It looks like she's fine. Uh, you know, how do you stay loose in between like that? A shot takes outside two and two. Well, most softball pitchers will do exactly what baseball pitchers do, and that's wear a jacket in the dugout. They'll stay warm. They'll loosen, keep their shoulders loose by either doing um, calisthenics or exercises. Just, and we're not talking jumping jacks in the dugout, but, <laughs> but just a little bit of shoulder rolls. And, and if the inning continues to be very long, they will step outside the dugout and throw a little bit. Strikeout number three for Jenny Finch. She is rolling through the China order. And Jenny with that outstanding stride. Look at the way that rise ball is just moving up through the zone and shot. No opportunity to hit that ball, but when it gets up into the eyes, it baits the batter into thinking they can hit it and they'll swing through that pitch. Jenny keeping that pitch out of the zone and doing a, a good job of getting the Chinese batters to swing through it. That was strikeout number 150 on the tour for Jenny Finch. It is tough to lay off that pitch. And then, like you said, Michelle, once it gets to the plate, there's just no way you're going to catch up to it swinging at a pitch up in your eyes. Well, as a hitter, you have to be very disciplined. You have to know your pitcher, and you have to know what is the best pitch to hit. Right now with China, they look like they are just swinging at almost every offering that Jenny puts up there. John Lee Fong with the foul ball there. And what's so impressive about Jenny is watch the way she's going to stride out to this eight foot circle. She's got long levers and she uses them. She, and she has a nice big arm circle. It's going to come all the way around. Look at the way she really uses her entire body to deliver that pitch to home. 0 oh, 2 to Fong. Waved out and missed. Strike three. That's four Ks for Finch. Two down and nobody on. Hayes now with five, 22 to 12 in favor of the Huskies. Five and a half to go in the first half. Pressure here in the backcourt. Rogers trying to get it across and gets to Rodriguez. Lead pass Fath. Has some room. Into the corner now. McKenzie for three. Good. Well, after going 0 for 6, the 
Tigers have made the last two from three-point land. She had big 6'3", Heather, Heather Buck coming right out at her. Didn't even phase her. Ferris, down low Buck. Layup no good, gets her own rebound, and follows it home, and she gets fouled. And that's a category to watch. Second chance points in this game because the Huskies are starting to do damage in that area. 11 points in that category to two for Pacific. I love this second effort from Buck. Look at her, keep it up high. She comes up, nice finger roll, but she stays with it. And that's a great effort from the sophomore. Heather Buck from Stonington, Connecticut, and makes the three-point play. Nice job, and a 10-point lead for UConn. Now another turnover for Pacific. Lead pass more for the easy layup, and the Huskies with their biggest lead of 12, and a timeout on the floor called by Pacific. So the Huskies are on a roll. Brad Eldred to lead it off for Fresno, grounded out to second his first trip as Bear Bay deals low for a ball 1-0. Each team in the home run, Kevin Richardson in the third and Brett Pill in the fourth, and that's the scoring in the game, 1-1. Eldred drills one to left field, way back and gone. No doubt about this one for Eldred, his 12th of the year, as he catches up to Brett Pill, tied for the team lead, and Fresno takes the lead, 2-1. He doesn't get cheated on his cuts, and when he hits them, they stay hit. I guess he doesn't hit many home runs that just barely crawl over the fence, though. No, and as I mentioned, uh, usually uh, they're to center field. And this second home run of this series, as Max Ramirez takes a ball, 1 0. Third time this year that Bay has allowed two home runs in a game. Ramirez checks his swing. Did he go? No, he didn't, says the first base umpire, Dixon Sturman. And the count is 2 0 to Max Ramirez. So power has resulted in all the scoring in this game. Cold strike, 2 and 1 to Ramirez. Hey, look at Bear's overall numbers, and opponents are hitting 318 against him coming in. 90 hits allowed in 73 in the third innings. So overall in the season, I mentioned that recently he's pitched so much better. But the numbers overall, you know that he's been knocked around on the season. At some point, you could take advantage. Hard hit ball at the middle, a base hit in the center field for Ramirez. His second hit is two for two. So the Giants just signed him the other day. This is his second game with the Grizzlies, and he is showing off his skills. Hanging breaking ball. Both hits Ramirez have been to uh, center field. And Ramirez mentioned this today that uh, a guy that, as he labeled, the label he put on himself was, I've always been a good hitting catcher. I want to know more of, I want people to know me that I'm a good defensive catcher. Steve Decker said about now having Max Ramirez and Hector Sanchez that Hector will still get the bulk of the starts behind the plate. But Max Ramirez provides a, a little veteran punch for the big league club. Certainly a guy that can help Hector Sanchez a little bit as well. Both, again, being from Venezuela, know each other quite well. I talked to Hector before the game yesterday. I said, how well do you know Max Ramirez? And he just had a big grin. He said, hey, same country, Venezuela, different towns, but they all know each other down there from winter ball. Sanchez got out in front of that one, and Navarro has a play in front of the Fresno dugout, in the dugout, and he can't get it. It just kept tailing away from him as he reached over the railing, and Sanchez is still alive. Sanchez is, is Navarro almost not. <laughs> well, he's not gonna get any help from the Grizzlies players over there. They're not gonna tell him how close he is. That was a nice effort. Sanchez behind 0-1. With Ramirez at first and nobody out. And bluffed at first by Bay. You know, I was talking about how Josh Towers didn't walk many 
hitters and how Bay reminds me of Towers. And Bay has pretty good numbers as far as not walking hitters. He hasn't walked anybody tonight. And sometimes that works against you. I remember Towers telling me one time that he had been told by several pitching coaches, don't throw too many strikes sometimes. It's just the opposite of what you normally hear. Base hit right field for Sanchez. So the two possible options for the Giants, a catcher down the road, maybe even this year, have base hits back to back. Ramirez and Sanchez are after the homer by Eldridge. Pika in the backfield with Chapel. They have two backs this time. I think it's the first time we've seen that, Darren. And an inside handoff for Pika, and that's going nowhere. Jonathan Cole was right there. He read the play. He's done that a couple of times. Yeah, Cole was in the, the back. You see the first half numbers right there. 11 for 19, 129 yards, one TD, one interception. And his rushing yards, 43 yards on uh, eight carries there. A decent night for him so far. And that play lost three yards. Second down and 13 for Conker. Again, two backs with Pika and Chapel, And a little screen pass going to Jacob Smith, but that didn't go anywhere as well. And that number eight again, Cole, was right there to make that tackle. You're gonna see right here, fakes it over to his left, throws it back to his right, that wide receiver screen, and you see Cole playing in the backfield right there, six foot one. 215 pound senior doing a tremendous job playing on the other side of the line of scrimmage. They're going backwards. They lost a couple of yards there, and it's third and 15 for Conker. Peak of the lone back. Two receivers to the near side and two receivers to the far side for Ricky Lloyd on third and long. And he unleashes one over the middle. Perfected and complete as it was intended for Terrence Young over the middle. That would have been first down yardage, but could not connect. And now, here we get the fourth down and long. And you're going to see uh, Lloyd right here going back, trying to throw it over the middle. You see number 28, Roberts, making a heck of a play. And look at it. He's eyeballing that, that ball, and he's trying to get the interception. Great coverage by Roberts, a 5'9", 165-pound sophomore. Now we mentioned that they've only punted eight times all year coming in, once tonight. And does he punt? Yes. Ricky Lloyd, the quarterback, will punt for the second time tonight. That might be a record as it lands right at midfield, bounces in the way of Casa Grande. Gets a nice Casa Grande bounce to the 47. And Casa Grande will start out in Conquer territory. And I like what Casa Grande's doing. They're putting a lot of pressure on their defensive back right now. They're saying, hey, you got to cover these receivers. And what they're doing, they're blitzing up front. Nick Sherry had pretty much a miserable first half. An interception on the first play of the game. And three for 10. Barely getting any yardage. We'll see what the Gauchos do here. Throw out in the flat, a little screen pass. Oh, and he picks up about seven or eight yards. Yeah, I like what they're doing right there. I like what Coach Herzog is doing. Like you said, he had a miserable first half. What does he do? He just has uh, Sherry raise up and throw the ball to Oden for an easy five to six yard gain right there. Giving this quarterback a lot of confidence right now. Just, just, let's just throw that ball out there and, and play catch. And he stepped out of bounds there after about five. So second down and five. And Sherry. Nice. El Marini in the backfield, he'll throw over the middle, and it is intercepted. Intercepted by Alito Thompson, second pick of the day for Sherry.